Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rod Codman. I'm with the Ventura County Public Defender's Office. Before we get started with uh, some background on our keynote speaker, I'd like to thank Pepperdine School of Law. What a great lunch, right? Thank you very much. It's a great lunch. I'd like to thank Pepperdine for, for putting on the event. I'd also like to thank Pepperdine for sending me all these great law clerks who works in our Veterans Treatment Court. So, thank you. I want to speak a little bit about our keynote speaker. Congresswoman Brownlee was elected in November of 2012. She represents Ventura County in Congress. The Congresswoman serves on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, where she's working to make sure that our nation provides the benefits and care our veterans and their families deserve. She does that in honor of their service to our country. Congresswoman, Congresswoman Brownlee was elected as the ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Health. She also serves on the House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs. As the ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, Congresswoman Brownlee focuses on improving veterans access to mental and physical health care, improving services for female veterans. And I'm going to pause here for a moment. Some of you may be aware of some of the recent legislation that the Congresswoman passed for some of our female veterans. She also works to help service members transition from military to the VA health care system. Congresswoman Brownlee also sits on the House Committee on Transportation Infrastructure, where she serves on the subcommittee on aviation, the subcommittee on Coast Guard, maritime transportation, and the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. One of Congresswoman Brownlee's highest priorities is to expand the care offered to Ventura County veterans in Ventura County and across the nation, not just to Ventura County. This includes expanding the size of the CBOC so that more providers can be hired and more specialty care can be offered. Since she took office in 2012, the CBOC has increased almost threefold in size. In February, at her urging, the House Veterans Affairs Committee passed a bill that would authorize a standalone VA run 40,000 square foot community clinic in Ventura County. It is the first facility for veterans to offer specialty care like auditory, cardiology, and dermatology in Ventura County. Since, co since coming to Congress, she's off, her office has returned more than $9.6 million in retroactive and estimated monthly benefits for veterans and their families. And we heard this morning from our panel how important that is. She encourages veterans with claims at the VA. And again, with our first panel this morning, we heard how important it was for those upgrades and those claims. She encourages veterans to contract her district offices for that assistance. Now, Congresswoman Brownlee primarily represents Ventura County as her congressional district. But I will tell you that Congresswoman Brownlee believes that all our vets, all of you here that have served, wherever you live, be it Ventura, Los Angeles, Mississippi, Tennessee, Bangor, Maine. She represents those vets also because they all serve and they're all our vets. So with that, please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Congresswoman Julia Brownlee. Well, good afternoon, and it's really uh, a delight to be here uh, with you all. And I thank uh, Pepperdine University for hosting this uh, very important uh, conference. And thank you, Rod, for a very kind introduction. Thank you, Jeff, and, and your team, all of you, for, for putting this together. Um, I, I really am very, very honored to be here. And, I think we're probably in one of the most beautiful settings uh, 
in the country, quite frankly. Uh, but Ventura County is a pretty special place, um, and when I'm back in Washington, D.C., I always say I live in one of the most beautiful areas um, in all of California. But it is uh, a beautiful district also for other reasons, and, and one is it is a, a county uh, that is home of Naval Base Ventura County. We have a lot of military men and women who live in our district, and we are also uh, the home of 50,000 uh, veterans in Ventura County. And I was uh, raised in a military family. My father was a proud Marine. My brother flew P3, uh, P3s for the Navy. Uh, my two uncles uh, served uh, in the Army and the Coast Guard and many of their friends uh, uh, served in the military. So I thought I knew something about the experience of those who have served our country and their families. And when I was elected in, in 2012, I immediately put my hat in to be on the committee that serves uh, our veterans in Washington. And I knew I could not, I could I could not only honor the many, many veterans in my district, uh, but I could honor all of the veterans throughout our country and really represent my own family and their service uh, to our country. And I was very pleased to not only be selected to serve on the committee, but then to be elected, as was mentioned, uh, as the ranking member on the subcommittee for health. Uh, the subcommittee has jurisdiction over all health care programs, both physical and mental, uh, provided by the VA. And as many of you know, the VA health care system is the largest integrated health care system in the country. Of the nation's 21 million veterans, almost 9 million are enrolled in VA health care. The VA's budget is over $175 billion a year and it employs over 340,000 uh, people. Many of them are veterans themselves. As I said before, I thought uh, growing up around so many veterans that I knew quite a bit about their challenges. But it wasn't until I joined the VA Committee in Congress that I truly began to understand the enormous challenge our country faces keeping good on its promise to provide veterans with the care, the benefits, and the support that they need to transition successfully back into civilian life. Of course, after multiple tours in Afghanistan and Iraq, and with important advancements and innovations in medicine, more veterans are coming home who have not in past wars, and that's really the good news, and it's a blessing. Uh, but it's also been a challenge uh, for the veterans and for the VA's uh, health care system. The other more emerging uh, health challenge is, not surprisingly, mental health. As I think back upon my own uh, upbringing, I, I cannot for one single moment remember any of my family members or their friends talk about the emotional impact of their service. The culture, thank thankfully, uh, is changing, and today the VA has compensated almost one million veterans for post-traumatic stress. But estimates are that one in five veterans returning from Afghanistan and Iraq suffer from post-traumatic stress. The National Institute of Health estimates that 31% of Vietnam veterans suffer as well from PTSD. During World War II, they called it shell shock or combat exhaustion, uh, but the numbers were roughly the same. I recently read a New Yorker article on the culture and the impacts of trauma, and the author quoted a friend who said, I can't see how anyone could go to Iraq and not come back with post-traumatic stress. And it, it's a good question, and I suspect it's, quite frankly, close, much closer to the truth. We also know that among those who met the criteria for post-traumatic stress or depression at the VA, only a third actually seek help or treatment. 
no matter how many veterans are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, and no matter how many receive treatment, we know that one in 10 returning veterans from Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom have problems with substance abuse. And whatever number you use, the rate of suicide among veterans is far higher than it is among civilians. Some say it's 20% higher, some say it's 50% higher. And the rate of female veteran suicide an issue, as was mentioned, that I've been working very closely on is even <clears throat> higher than that. Among the homeless population, the numbers are fuzzy, but estimates put homeless veterans at close to 40,000, making up around 7% of the total homeless population nationwide. Another shocking statistic, uh, a recent survey by the VA shows that two in five service women said they had experienced either sexual assault or some kind of sexual harassment in the military. A study done in 2011 suggested that women veterans were three to four times more likely to be homeless compared to non-veteran women. I know you'll be discussing many of these issues today and tomorrow, but the statistics are quite stark. One statistic that is a little more optimistic, however, is the declining rate of incarceration um, among our veterans. In 1978, 24% of pri prisoners were veterans. Today, veterans make up just 8% of the national prison population. And I believe that decline is due in part to the substantial increase in the number of veteran treatment courts in recent years. As you may know, the first court was founded in 2008, and that, quite frankly, wasn't very long ago, um, by Judge Robert Russell in Buffalo, New York. Today, there are more than 300 uh, across our country, including in my district uh, in Ventura County. I first visited Ventura County Veterans Treatment Court in 2014. The court was formed in 2010 through the leadership and efforts of Judge Colleen Toy White and with the buy-in of many local veteran advocates, the VA, the District Attorney's Office, and the Ventura County Public Defender's Office. What I remember most uh, from that first visit was just the genuine care and commitment uh, of the staff and the attention, really, that they gave to each veteran. It was very much a team approach where everyone came together to map out a unique recovery plan for each veteran in the program. They would walk through the veteran's circumstances to prescribe a plan, whether it was group therapy, counseling, or medication. The court used a variety of approaches, each tailored to the veteran's specific situation. They would also problem solve to break down barriers, big or small, for the veteran, like make, just making sure the veteran had transportation uh, to an appointment or actually making the appointment uh, for the services uh, the veteran needed. The, the court, quite frankly, became a savior for, for these veterans, a community of people who finally cared and understood them, and it provided the structure they needed uh, to rebuild their lives. The Ventura County Treatment Court initially served 25 veterans, but today it's serving over 100. And that's pretty amazing, and, uh, but we still, of course, it's still not fulfilling uh, all of the needs uh, within the county. The stories of the veterans who wind up in these courts are probably, uh, are probably uh, familiar uh, to many of you. Petty Officer Mark Martinez is one. He faced DUI charges because he resorted to binge drinking to cope with the terrible experiences he saw during combat during his eight years of service with the U.S. Navy. Or there's Jennifer Wormuth. She left her children and their father to serve and protect us. When she returned, she used drugs to cope with her stress and separation and anxiety. It led her down a dark path as she was struggling to keep, just simply keep her family off the street. 
And then there's Ch uh, Chief Petty Officer Rashad Boyd. He was a combat medic who saw the trauma of war every single day fighting to help his fellow brothers and sisters survive on the battlefield. He had nightmares and used alcohol and drugs to deal with his depression that caused him to alienate his wife and almost take his own life. Mark, Jennifer, and Rashad, they are the faces of the many veterans who are struggling to make sense of life after war. And while they share a commonality in having arrived at the Veterans Treatment Court, their life experience before, during, and after their service is as unique and individual as each one of them are. These veterans come to the court looking for a second chance, and oftentimes it may be their last chance. It's not uncommon that veterans come in with deep-seated mental health challenges that have plagued them for years without having received the care they need to address these challenges. These underlying issues lead to a cycle of destructive behavior that ultimately brings our veterans before the courts. And the courts work for a number of reasons, but in my experience with the Ventura County Treatment Court, three main drivers, the three main drivers for success are as follows. First, uh, the veteran is committed to turning things around. Anyone who went through the program will tell you that they are grateful for the treatment court program, but no one will tell you that it was easy. Second, the staff at the court are so very committed to the cause. In fact, many do this work on top of their day jobs. They volunteer their time on lunch breaks and evenings, weekends, and sandwiched between busy work schedules and responsibilities of life. And finally, our court works because we have an extended community of organizations and individuals to provide the support system necessary, not only to make it through the program, but to be there for the veteran long after the program is completed. Ventura County has over 120 organizations dedicated to helping veterans succeed in civilian life. We call it our military collaborative that brings these organizations together under one roof to coordinate their efforts and to initiate active dialogue with the VA. We, al we also have tremendous buy-in from our district attorney, our county sheriff, our public defender, and our legislators. I'm pleased to say that over 300 veteran treatment courts around the country are currently working with over 13,000 veterans. That's a 40% increase since 2008. And that's great, and we must recognize that progress, but it is still not enough. Funding for the courts is currently inadequate, and it comes from many sources, including local, state, and federal funding. While I've worked to increase federal funding for veteran treatment courts, and many of my colleagues in Congress as well, um, by more than 20% each year, it's still just a paltry $6 million for the entire nation. We absolutely need to do more. And we spend billions and billions of dollars preparing our men and women for the battlefield. But we hardly think about the cost of, of, the cost of their successful transition back into civil, civilian life, and I believe that paradigm really needs to change substantially. And while we know that 60% to 80% of justice-involved veterans had a substance use disorder prior to their incarceration, we know that 25 to 40% were suffering from a mental health disorder, and 23% were homeless at some point in the year preceding court. We still don't have enough data on the outcomes uh, across the country of our courts. If these courts, I believe, uh, are to succeed and to grow, we are going to need more of that data. We also need to share best practices to create more opportunities for partnerships 
and to create more comprehensive programs and interconnected networks of resources and services like we have in the county under the military collaborative. That's why I believe this conference uh, is so critically important. By forming a community of professionals, we take the most important first step in creating a stronger, more collaborative approach to justice for our veterans. Whether it is the judge or legal staff that manage the case, the service providers and VA professionals who offer treatment, or the veteran peers and mentors who stand side by side with the veteran through the whole journey. We need a fully integrated and multifaceted approach to truly address the problems affecting some of our veterans caught in the justice system. We can accomplish both of these goals with, with more involvement by dedicated professionals like yourselves and more conferences like this one. And we must continue to spread the word to our communities, to our justice system, and to our elected officials. In fact, whenever someone asks me how I could possibly bear the dysfunction of Congress, and I'm letting you know right now there is a little bit of that back in Washington, I will always tell them about the stories of the lives we are able to impact through casework, especially veteran casework, and through programs like the Veterans Court. Those stories include that of Petty Officer Mark Martinez, who received the help he needed through a veterans treatment court to overcome his drinking problem and post-traumatic stress. He is currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in political science right here at Pepperdine University. And Jennifer Wormuth, who was able to rebuild her life and now works as a peer support specialist at the VA. And Chief Petty Officer Rashad Boyd, who has been able to address his mental health issues and substance abuse and plans to become a drug and alcohol counselor for other veterans. So on behalf of Mark, Jennifer, and Rashad, and the over 13,000 veterans currently participating in veteran treatment courts around the country, thank you for being here today and for the work that you do. Building communities of collaboration is essential to making sure that our veterans receive every opportunity to succeed. And so I want to, again, thank Pepperdine for hosting this important conference. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Rod, for, for putting this together um, and for all of you being here. If there's anything uh, I can do, it comes out of your discussions over the next two days, um, please call our office and talk to me because there might be important ideas and potential legislation that could come out of this caucus. I just thank you all very, very much and our military men and women who have served our country so very, very bravely and to all of the veterans who are here, thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service, but I know they deserve better and we can do better. So thank you very much.